This podcast is brought to you by Progressive. Most of you aren't just listening right now. You're driving, cleaning, and even exercising. But what if you could be saving money by switching to Progressive? Drivers who save by switching save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Multitask right now. Quote today at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Welcome to Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's parenting podcast for Monday, February 6th, the Salt to Story edition. I'm Jamila Lemieux, a writer, contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column, and mom to Naima, who is nine and three quarters, and we live in Los Angeles. I'm Zach Rosen. I make a different show. It's called the Best Advice Show podcast. And I am dad to Noah, who's five, and Ami, who's two. We live in Detroit. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the homeschool and family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 10, Oliver, who's eight, and Teddy, who's six. We live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today on the show, we're going to be talking about children's literacy. More specifically, how many students across the U.S. weren't actually taught how to read. Emily Hanford, host of the podcast Sold a Story, will be joining us to explain just how this happened and what the repercussions are for children and teachers affected. So that'll be up first. After our discussion with Emily, we're going to dole out some recommendations, and then we're going to wrap up the show by digging into our mailbag. See you back here in a second. Since signing the 15% pledge in 2020, Macy's has increased the number of Black-owned brands they carry eightfold. Now, during Black History Month and all year long, they're continuing their support for Black creators, changemakers, and causes. Join Macy's in celebrating Black history and Black brilliance by shopping Black-owned brands. And you can help fund scholarships for students at historically Black colleges and universities by donating online and rounding up in-store for UNCF. Learn more at Macy's.com slash purpose. That's Macy's.com slash purpose. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Therapy Online. Unfortunately, life doesn't come with a user manual. So when it's not working for you, it's normal to feel stuck. Navigating any of life's challenges can make you feel unsure, whether it's a career change, a new relationship, or becoming a parent. Therapists are trained to help you figure out the cause of challenging emotions and learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy the closest thing to a guided tour of the complex engine called you. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match you with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you could easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash madaf. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash madaf. We are back and we're going to dive into Elizabeth's interview with Emily Hanford. But before we do, Elizabeth and Zach, I'm curious. Do either of you all remember learning how to read yourselves? Nope. I know I did, but I don't have distinct <laughs> memories. Have your kids started, Zach? Ami has not, um, but Noah... <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Noah's, uh, she's really good at identifying letters, but that's as far as, as we've got. Naeem and I had two very different experiences. I was a really early reader. My mother, I don't know how she did it, but I was able to read in preschool so like my earliest memory of that is like being at a friend of hers house and like picking up an Essence magazine and reading it. And oh, that's you know, such them, a good origin story for you. I know, right? And them being like, "Oh my goodness," you know. And my mom was like, "See, she can really read." Um, <laughs> and then getting to kindergarten, where the other kids were learning how to read, and since I could already read, they sat me in the corner with a math workbook and Ugh. just had me do pages from that. So that begins my lifelong hatred of math. Hmm. Um, Naima was taught to read in pre-K and kindergarten. You know, they did a really excellent job. I wish I could take more responsibility for helping her with that, but it's something that she picked up at school. Henry learned to read. We were living in the Netherlands, learned to read in Dutch first, and I was doing some work at home, wow. sounding out things, and then 
literally, I think probably three or four days after the teacher told us he could read in Dutch, he was able to read in English. And I think he just falls into wow. this this bracket of students that we talk about that just reading kind of, cut, they just sort of figure it out. But this is not everyone. And with Oliver, who has dyslexia and a whole bunch of other, you know, things, the reading was really difficult. In fact, when we moved here two years ago, he basically still could not read. He was sounding out things that just really hadn't clicked. I very much remember the, like, hooked on phonics, the, like, Mm. sounding things out. But I was kind of completely insulated from what U.S. schools were doing about reading, since I had largely been in the, like, homeschool reading community while I was here. And, And that is, like, very strictly phonics. You learn to read by sounding out the words, right? Like, how else would you learn to read? Well, Emily is going to tell us the system that many schools in the U.S. have been using really isn't teaching kids how to do that reading. So let's take a listen to my interview with Emily. I'm Emily Hanford. I'm a senior correspondent for American Public Media. I cover education, and I'm the host of the recent podcast, Sold a Story, How Teaching Kids to Read Went So Wrong. So, Emily, I'm so excited to have you with us. You have been reporting on education for a long time. Can you tell us what drew you into the issue of children's literacy? So I've been covering education since 2008, always making long-form radio documentaries, then podcasts come along podcasts, articles, covering education at all levels, Um, you know, usually like two or three topics a year, looking at things in depth. And usually one topic kind of leads to another. That's the way it goes. So it was 2016. And I was reporting on so-called remedial education in college. So I was interviewing all of these students and instructors about reading problems in college and people who had come to college and they couldn't read very well. I did this one interview with this student who told me about her reading problems that she never got identified, never got any help with. She was in this remedial writing class. Long story short, I just was so fascinated by this woman and her sort of story about how she got to college without really being able to read very much at all. So she told me about how she has dyslexia, something she had basically figured out about herself. She had never been diagnosed. She had never gotten really the right kind of help in school. What I learned is like kids who have dyslexia are often not getting identified in school. They're not getting the kind of help they want. Their parents end up desperate. What's going on here with my kid? How can I, you know, what what can I do to help her or him? I realized that dyslexia was like the tip of this iceberg. Many kids in schools across the country are not being taught how to read. The sort of assumption writ large is that they need like a little bit of instruction, but a lot of time with books and they'll figure it out. And that if you read with a kid and you put lots of books in their hands, that reading the words is something that they'll eventually be able to figure out. And that's kind of, I think, the way it worked with me, honestly. Mm. And I think it's kind of the way it worked with my kids. Like, learning to read was pretty easy for them. So I never really thought about this before. So I met all these parents of kids with dyslexia. I learned that there's this gigantic body of research on reading and how it works and what people actually need to learn and why some of us learn it really easily and why some of us really need a lot of instruction. And so I was on this topic for years. Finally, I just, I was like, I'm not doing anything else. I'm just going to do this one. And that led to Sold a Story. I did this podcast to try to explain the why of it. And essentially, Sold a Story just started with a question, which is, there's so much known about reading and how it works. So why do a lot of teachers not know about it? Why do a lot of people in schools not know about it? Why aren't kids being taught to read in ways that really line up with all that is now known? about reading and how it works. You have parents and teachers that you interview that as they are learning this, they're shocked, right? They Even people who are, who are let's say, quote unquote, well-educated in this topic, like they've received a lot of training. And I think I just found that so surprising. So can you help us get a sense of scale? Like how big of a problem really is this? So it's really actually hard to get detailed numbers on that. We live in a huge country, and we have a lot of schools and a lot of school systems. And a fundamental idea in our school system, going way back to when we started public education hundreds of years ago, is local control. The idea Mm -hmm. that everyone's supposed to be able to sort of do it the way they want. So because of that, 
there's no accounting that's being taken. <laughs> How are you teaching reading? What are you using? So one of the things we did in our reporting is sort of try to get an accounting of that. A really impossible task, frankly, because one of the things that we realized early on in our reporting is that you could go in and you could get receipts, you could find out like everything that schools had bought, but just all the things they had bought didn't necessarily tell you how reading was being taught. There are schools all over the country that have programs that are still sitting in shrink wrap. <laughs> right, and, right. Uh, you know, and also the program, the, the curriculum that people use, doesn't tell you everything you need to know about how reading is being taught. Teachers are bringing a lot of their own materials. They might be given a big fat textbook, but they're only using part of it because no one can use everything that's in a big fat textbook. A big aha through years of reporting and looking at all kinds of survey data and little p clues and pieces we could figure out is that even though the idea is that every state and every school district and every school and even every classroom can sort of teach reading the way they want, it's not like there's a thousand flowers blooming out there. <laughs> Lots of people are teaching reading in the same way. There's a set of kind of ideas about reading and how it works and how kids should learn to do it. And that was a big aha in my reporting. The soul to story is really about an idea. It's about an idea about how kids learn to read and how this idea took hold in schools. And the idea, I boil it down to this very basic thing. It's going to sound so simple right now, but the idea is basically kids don't have to sound out words when they come to words they don't know. They can, but they don't have to because they have all these other things that they can do to figure out the words. So a little kid coming into school knows the meaning of lots of words, they know how to talk, all that. What they've really got to figure out, what many of them don't know really anything about yet, is how to decode the words, how to like figure out those written words. And so there's this idea that kids have lots of strategies. When they come to a word they don't know, they could sound it out. In fact, in English, to be able to sound out a word, you actually have to know a decent amount. So it can be very hard. So much. Yeah. <laughs> very hard for a five or six-year-old to sound out a word. So these other strategies were introduced, and they were really introduced for well-meaning reasons. We want kids to figure out these words. And it turns out that English is a really hard language, and there's a lot that you need to know, and many teachers don't get trained in all the things they need to know about written English to teach it to a five, six, seven-year-old. So these other strategies really took hold. Um, and there are things like, you can look at the first letter, you can look at the last letter, you can look at the picture, you can think of a word that makes sense. And for some kids, that's going to work. And I'm putting that in quotes because it's not necessarily that that's really working. It's just that kids are figuring out how to sound out the words anyway through the exposure to the text, through the fact that a father is sitting a little girl on his lap and reading and pointing to the words and sounding them out and all that. At least half of us and probably a little more than half of us, that's actually not really enough. And if yeah. all you do is sort of just teach them little bits and pieces and expect it to come together, you're just not going to end up with a very good reader. You're going you're gonna to end up with someone who struggles with spelling for all of their life. And some kids, kids who have dyslexia, and dyslexia is a spectrum, it's a continuum, right? So like yeah. someone doesn't sort of have or not have dyslexia. It depends on like where you decide the cutoff is. But human being and our brains are on this spectrum of how easy this is for us. Some of us, it's really easy. Some of it's really, really hard. And most of us are in the middle. And the big aha is that, ah, if we actually teach the kids how to read, it's going to be the best strategy for making sure that the most of us can read as well as we possibly can. Yes. I, so I um, actually am in a phase of life where I'm homeschooling. And so I think one of the shockers for me listening to this is that I, I was so insulated from this because the overarching homeschool method is phonics. You got to teach the phonics. And yes, when we're sounding out a word, maybe we look at the picture and say like, what word that kind of has these sounds is in this picture? Yeah, it can <laughs> be know? an assist 100%. And, the, and, the, and it can really help you with the meaning too. Like a kid's like, it's a crocodile. What is a crocodile? Oh, let's talk about that. There's a picture of a crocodile. But you you have this episode that was an aha moment for me that I think also was for you, where you're with the group of adults and, and they are, quote unquote, learning to read this, <laughs> this book in a different language. And that is when it sort of, I think, occurs to you that maybe we're just defining what learning to read is differently. <laughs> Can you yes, tell it does. us about that moment? Because that to me is when I, when all of this 
not made sense because it still doesn't totally make sense. But when I was like, oh, we are looking at two different goals here. (laughs) Yes, yes. I do think that everyone agrees on the goal of, right, the goal is reading comprehension. Everyone needs to be able to understand what they read. The question really is, how does a little kid get there? How do our brains do that? And what you see in that scene is a group of teachers who are sitting and sort of following this idea that has taken hold in American schools that kind of like getting the gist of the words, that if you're getting the meaning, if you're getting the basics, if you're getting some of the words, that you're, you're getting there. But actually, if you, if you really think hard about that, it takes you off into a wild land of what are we talking about <laughs> yes, here? Like, yes. don't we actually need to read the words that the author wrote and know that? And sure, we can analyze those things differently. We interpret differently. We take things away with our own experience. But we at least have to all agree that there are particular words that the author wrote, and these are the words, and this is what they mean. And can we at least all agree on that? And then we can have our own different interpretations of what those words mean. And I think that's really where American schooling has kind of writ large fallen down, is forgetting about the importance of the words themselves and making sure that we get those. You know, maybe it doesn't matter with our five and six-year-olds, but it certainly matters in high school and our college students and our students studying beyond that, right? Well, here's the thing. It does matter with the five and six-year-olds because beginning texts are relatively easy and there are pictures and there should be pictures. I'm not arguing that the pictures yeah. should be taken away in any way. But kids can fool you. Kids can look like good readers for a while, second grade, third grade, and then it really starts to fall apart on them by like third and fourth grade. Yeah. Because they're starting to come across words they've never seen before. They haven't memorized. The words are longer, multisyllabic words, you know, these long words and kids start to get freaked out by those because they don't know where to start with a word that has five syllables in it. I do want to talk about, to the the publishing company that is at the the heart of this, because so much of Sold a Story is, is about how we, maybe as the public, the teachers, the school system, was truly sold this <laughs> curriculum, like with cult fanaticism in, in some cases, which you the, the podcast does such a great job of demonstrating. <laughs> how did this billion dollar kind of industry pushing this come to be? So we do focus on one publishing company and these four authors. And they're sort of the name brand version of this, but they're not the only ones. There's billions and billions of dollars in educational publishing. There's lots of companies, small and large, lots of little companies. There's lots of consultants who go to schools and provide professional development. And there's a lot of people who've bought in writ large to this idea called balanced literacy, which sounds really good because we all desperately want and need more balance in all things in the world, and we should have it. So balanced literacy sounds really good. But what I realized in my reporting on all of this and what I try to show in Sold a Story is that this balanced literacy idea is sort of rooted in this idea about reading that turns out not to be true, which is, in fact, we really do. To become good readers at that early stage of learning how to read, you need to laboriously sound out the words because the way you're becoming a good reader is by sounding out the words and connecting the pronunciation of a word with its spelling and its meaning. So this company, it's called Heinemann. It's based in New Hampshire. They have become sort of a brand name version of balanced literacy. So they just have materials that turn out to be wildly popular in schools for teaching reading, not just teaching reading, and not everything that this company is selling is problematic. I just point out these four authors, and there are even other authors in the, that this company publishes that are selling this balanced literacy idea. And I think they just became really good at selling this idea to schools because they came along and they offered solutions to a lot of problems that teachers are having. And teachers across this country have a really hard job, number one. And many of them are going into schools and being expected to teach kids to read, and they haven't actually been taught how to do that. They didn't get good training on that. They weren't taught a lot of this science of reading. They weren't taught what they need to know about the written English. So many of them are kind of lost and desperate and desperately want to teach their kids how to read. 
looking around for solutions and various people, one of them is this company and the authors that I talk about, but like I said, there are others, have come along with solutions that are helpful. Mm -hmm. Routines, practices, actual curricular materials, assessment systems, intervention programs that'll help the kids who are struggling, just things that schools need. But what I show is that there's this one sort of small but really important idea about reading and how it works that's not right there. And it's really gotten the whole system kind of off. How have teachers responded to your reporting? You know, not in one monolithic way. Yeah. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> I hear from a lot of teachers who didn't know this stuff. And at first, they tend to really resist because... It's hard to take in the idea that you've been teaching reading and you didn't know everything you needed to know, and that you might have actually been teaching some strategies to kids that not only weren't helping them, but that I think there's some pretty good evidence actually harm yeah. some kids. Some kids do these things. They, they cling to these strategies that seem to work, especially with early texts, better than laboriously sounding out the words, which if no one's taught them how to do it, many of them can't do it. I think there's really a reckoning going on. That's actually the name of the final episode of the podcast, The Reckoning. I think there's really a reckoning going on among a lot of people. And teachers are the group that is, they have guilt and shame and a huge amount of sadness. And they remember the faces and the names of the kids that they didn't teach how to read. And they know who those kids are. They remember them. And they many of them had a gut feeling in their stomach, like something's not quite right here. And, you know, a lot of times they're just sort of searching, searching. Well, you know, I've got these five kids or these 10 kids or these 15 kids, depending on the class, who don't seem to be really getting it. And they're sort of always searching for like, what am I supposed to do for them? But I think at the end of the day, I just don't think there are teachers who don't want to teach kids how to read. They desperately do want to teach kids to read. Yeah. But it's overwhelming. This is a lot to know. It's overwhelming at an emotional level, and it's overwhelming at a practical, intellectual level. Like, what do I do? When do I find the time to read the stuff I need to read? Who's going to help me find a different or better curriculum? How am I supposed to be assessing the kids if I'm not supposed to be doing it this way that I've been doing it for 15 years? This is really hard. It's hard. Yeah, I mean, I felt so much for the teachers in your piece. Like, these are the people in the classroom fighting for our kids. And so often the advocacy came from teachers who were also parents who see their child struggle with what they've been teaching. And that is kind of the straw that says, like, gosh, this isn't working. I need to do something. I need to ask some more questions. Um, so it also, you know, many of these cases fell on them to try to fix this problem. We're at a very, uh, let's say, interesting time in terms of uh, parental involvement in school curriculum. Yes, indeed. <laughs> the politics of all this are very complicated yes. and all over the place and fascinating. And there's potential caution and dangers in all of that. One person might be wanting them to change reading instruction and change something else. And someone's like, oh, no, 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 I don't necessarily want them to change that, but I want them to change reading instruction. So I think one of the things that's kept me intellectually interested in education reporting for so long is because the politics are really unpredictable. But I do think there are a lot of teachers out there who really want and need help. And there are a lot of like states at taking action. Policy is a very blunt force instrument, and there are always unintended consequences, and not all the things that people are doing are going to result in what they want it to result on, and there's going to be pushback and blowback, and it gets messy. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know. With all this in mind, though, do you have advice for what, like, parents, but specifically maybe even, like, teachers, school administrators, like, what are they supposed to do with all this information? <laughs> like, you've yeah. presented this this great sort of tragic story what do we do now? Well, I'll tell you what people are doing. Like, so this is what people tell me, uh, what's worked for them. What's worked for them is finding the other teachers and parents in your school, in your community, wherever it is. You're not alone. If you're a teacher, you're not the only teacher who's having these questions, who's thinking about this. You're not the only parent. I mean, I think that's in a big... The parents of struggling readers have felt alone for so long, and I think they're finally realizing, like, oh, I'm really not alone here. And I think that even the parents of kids who don't struggle are, are taking an interest in this. What can I do? What should I do? So I would say just find the other people 
who care about this because when people try to tackle this problem on their own, ask any parent of a kid with dyslexia and you will find stories over and over again of them trying to confront kind of the school on their own and they feel, I mean, the words that they've used to me, and I'm not saying the schools are doing this intentionally necessarily, but they feel very bullied. <laughs> yeah. You know, at the end of the day, they sometimes put up their hands. And they sometimes still take their kid out of school or they'll solve the problem on their own, which is why this is such an important thing to get right. Because at the end of the day, this early reading instruction, it's an equity issue. It's a civil rights issue. Because what's happening all over the country is that if your child goes to school and is really struggling with reading and you notice, you see, you see what's going on, you, if you have the time and the money, especially the money, you are going to fix that problem. And so... Parents of affluent kids are often, at great emotional and financial cost, finding a way to make sure their kids are taught how to read, but lots of kids aren't. So if schools aren't teaching kids how to read, some kids don't have a backup. They don't have like a second chance. I think for too long we've seen this as a problem of poverty, that when kids aren't reading, it's because they're poor. And it's not to say that poverty doesn't play a role. Once you understand something about reading and how it develops, Poverty and environment make a huge difference. Yes, mm-hmm. it's it, definitely. But I think what's really happening is some kids are really lucky in getting the instruction they need in school. There are schools out there that are teaching reading really well. But a, a lot of them aren't or aren't teaching it as well as they should. And so a lot of kids are getting the instruction they need out, outside of school. And that's not public education. That's no. not public education. I think this is a really good place to end. We will, of course, link to Sold a Story in the show notes. Everyone, whether you have children in school, you don't have children in school, go listen. It's available wherever you can get your podcasts. But Emily, where else can people follow you and find your reporting? We have a website, soldastory.org. There's a discussion guide there. There's a reading list. We have a couple of other articles that you can read. Soldastory.org and at E. Hanford is where you can find me. And I had a wonderful co-reporter on this named Christopher Peak. He's at CL Peak. There's an underscore in there somewhere, but I can't remember where. Um, <laughs> anyway, you can find our bios on our website. Well, Emily, thank you so much. I'm just so pleased to be able to share all of this with our listeners. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Good stuff, Elizabeth. We're going to take another quick break and then join you back here for recommendations and our mailbag. Support for this podcast comes from WISE, the universal account that lets you send, spend, and receive money internationally. With one account for over 50 currencies, who exactly is WISE made for? It's made for jet setters and slow travelers, for seeing old friends in new places. WISE is made for business in the city and pleasure on the coast, for studying abroad and supporting your little brother's schooling back home. WISE is made for people without borders who want to live truly global lives with ease. You see, with WISE, you always get the mid-market exchange rate whenever you convert or spend different currencies. There are no markups and no hidden fees. That's pounds to pesos, dollars to dong, just like that. Helping you save on currency conversion wherever your money takes you. WISE, it's the account that's made for the world. Join 13 million customers and learn how the WISE account could work for you at wise.com slash slate. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. 
Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcasts plus. It's finally time for recommendations. Zach, what are you recommending? I am recommending establishing a kid's table in your dining room. This is not for use for every meal, but I put a little table. It used to be in our basement where we were doing crafts on it, but it got too small. And then I brought it up a couple weeks ago when we were having friends over. And we first used it when we had some friends of ours over who also had two kids. So the so our two kids and their two kids sat together during a dinner party, and that was very cute. But I left it up there. And since then, um, Noah and Ami have taken a couple meals when it's just the four of us at that table on their own. And A, it's very cute. But B, it's also like a kind... It's it's not a date night for the parents. It's not like you can really get them, <laughs> you know, to, to not bother you. But like, there have been a couple spans of like five or ten minutes where the two of them are entertaining each other. And then I can actually have a conversation with Shira during dinner, which is, you know, unprecedented when it's all four of us. And when, you know, one or both kids are trying to sit on one of our laps and there's, you know, spaghetti on the ceiling and soup on the dog's tail. Uh, So this is just a nice way to get a little bit of reprieve if you are in the position where you're feeling like, man, dinner time is just so chaotic. I would love to just take a beat. So just put a little table in the corner and see if your kid or kids will go and have that experience with each other. Because I think it's also kind of fun and empowering for them to feel a little sense of independence. And it's nice for Noah where she can kind of like help Ami cut his food. And it, it's sweet and uh, kind of nice. So little kid's table in the corner if you have the That's space. so cute. I love Super that. Super cute. <laughs> what about you, Elizabeth? I'm recommending a really fun math game called Add Some Moody. So it's addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. Uh, There's a card game. There's also a free version you can play online. But basically, the great part about this game is you can play it with a lot of people at different math levels because it's not necessarily trying to go faster than anyone else. Everybody gets their own card and has all these numbers and you have a piece of scrap paper and you're making out an equation that works with the card. There's like a number in the middle and that's the number you have to get to. Uh, We play where like the younger kids just can use two numbers. The adults have to use four numbers to make it work out. And then whoever gets to five cards wins. You know, you can put cards back if they're not working for you. It just works Uh, There's a really fun kind of math game that we can all play. It doesn't last very long, um, but we really like it. And the kids really like to go online and play that independently. So it's called Add Samudi. Nice. Very fun. So I'm recommending Cobra Kai. It's a Netflix Mm -hmm. series based on the Karate Kid films. I'm not super into it, but Naeem is into it. It was just renewed for its sixth and final season. Yeah, we're, I think, on season two. Yeah, I hear it's great. Yeah. On that note, we're going to wrap up today with a follow-up listener letter about a recent episode where we talked about shoplifting. Dear Mom and Dad, I was listening to the response about the teenagers who are stealing from Sephora and wondered whether the letter writer's teen was either in on the action and wanted help getting out or actually telling her friends to stop, as she told her mom she was, but still wanting mom's help. Essentially, I'm wondering if she's scared to keep hanging out with them because she might get caught alongside them, but also scared to ruin her social life if she tells her parents or someone at Sephora. I don't have any kids myself. I love the show anyway. But I can very much picture myself as a teenager telling a trusted adult, as y'all said, 80% of the truth in hopes that said adult would have a magic solution that would make my friends stop, but not get me into trouble. I'm curious what your advice would be if the letter writer thinks that this is what might be going on. Thanks for a great show. Yeah, I thought this was a very keen observation, one that I didn't pick up entirely when we first talked about it. So it's definitely a complicating factor here. It is for sure. But it's like similar if your kid calls you from a party, right? And they shouldn't be at the party or things are happening at the party and they want picked up or they want help. Mm -hmm. You're going to go help them. That doesn't also mean that you're not like, you made some poor decisions. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think it is entirely possible that they actually do want their parents to step in and do something. But I think the best way to figure that out would be to, you know, if the original letter writer is listening and you're still dealing with this issue, maybe have another conversation and ask, like, Are they doing this with you? 
You know, have you been present for this happening? Um, Because I think that's part of what was unclear before. You know, like, had she ever been present for any of this theft? Um, Had she witnessed it herself? Or was she just seeing them come back to school with a bunch of Sephora, you know, and hearing about how they're stealing? Because that could be part of the reason she's concerned. Either she's been witnessing it happen and she's afraid of getting in trouble or perhaps she has participated in it. And also asking, honestly, like, you know, this is a safe space for you to tell me, you know, have you participated in this? I'd rather you be honest with me than to keep it to yourself. And this is a judgment-free zone. Perhaps this is a one-time pass, you know, like, I just need to know the truth. But this is, you know, this remains a very tricky situation because, as I maintained before, those little stuck-up girls with the money and the influence will mess up your social life, Mm. you know? So I wouldn't jump into um, putting on the hero cape and and trying to talk to these kids' parents unless you felt that absolutely needed to be done. Yeah. All right, listeners, thank you so much for your support. Just as a reminder, if you ever want to reach us, send us a voicemail or an email to slate.com. That's it for this episode of Mom and Dad are Fighting, which was produced by Rosemary Belson and Mara Curry. Alicia Montgomery is VP of Audio at Slate. For Zach Rosen and Elizabeth Newcamp, I'm Jamila Lemieux. Thanks for listening. <laughs>